All right. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, wherever you're watching from. Thanks for joining us, spending a little bit of your Saturday with us um, for the third uh, Lucas Museum Online Sewing Circle. My name is Nanette Luarca Schof, and I am the Managing Director of Education here at the Lucas Museum, which is a museum that is currently under construction in Los Angeles uh, in Exposition Park. Um, we are here today, um, and I wanted to start out with some gratitude. I wanted to call out, shout out to the team of the Lucas Museum, who's really worked very hard on this project, uh, this mask making project, as well as the sewing circles uh, that we're here to celebrate. And so I wanted to say thank you to Adriana Ridings, Miriam Tabatai, um, Jenny Miyazaki, Maisha Ward, um, and Alex Capriotti especially, but also the several um, other colleagues who have really um, pitched in on this project. Um, so this is, this project is 1500 masks that we had. We asked 12 artists who are all based in Los Angeles to make these masks for a, um, organizations providing for communities in need who are based in Los Angeles. And so I want to tell you a little bit about some of the organizations that um, these artists were sewing for. And if you're watching on Facebook, tell us if you're sewing right now, if you're sewing for people, if you're sewing for ma sewing masks, tell us who you're sewing for too. Um, and you can use the hashtag, uh, hashtag I sew for. Um, so I wanted to start out um, by uh, introducing um, Adrian Devine who made masks for the 1736 Family Crisis Center, which is dedicated to comprehensively helping children, women, men, and families through crises, including domestic violence, homelessness, poverty, and other emotional and life survival challenges. Um, we've gotten some amazing pictures from the organizations who are really grateful to these artists for sewing those, sewing masks. Um, Adrian Devine is a mixed media artist based in Pasadena. Um, and, you know, Adrian, you use quite a wide variety of materials in your artistic practice. Um, will you tell us a little bit about the place of sewing in your work? Um, sewing. I started sewing when I was a kid, um, initially just hand sewing doll clothes. And then when I was about 12 in the seventh grade was the first time I had any, you know, formal training in sewing because we had uh, home ec was part of the curriculum back in the, you know, Jurassic days. Um, and so I learned how to sew there. And then um, after that, I took a workshop at what was a Singer sewing machine store. They gave sewing lessons where I, really, I learned, you know, some more advanced type of techniques. Um, also did some sewing at uh, Pasadena City College. I took a uh, pattern drafting class. And so sewing has always been something that I've done. You know, when I had children, I made my kids clothes. I used to make myself clothes. But what this project has done, you know, got me to bring my sewing machine out of storage <laughs> and um, kind of rekindled my um, interest in sewing. Uh, I also have a background in weaving and um, surface design, batik, dyeing. So uh, I think I've always had some sort of textile interest in my work, you know, be it for practical purposes or for a more creative type of expression. And then also my mother sewed. And I learned years later that my grandmother was a seamstress. She died when my mother was a year and a half old, so I never knew her. But I talked to one of my older aunts and she told me, she remembered vividly, she was I think 90 something at the time, and she remembered vividly that my grandmother had um, made her dress. She described the collar and you know the whole outfit and how she went skipping down the street with her outfit that my grandmother had made for her. So I think between my grandmother, my mother, um, you know, it's, it seems like it's sort of in my DNA. And then in, even in my painting, my work tends to be um, kind of pattern-like. I've had people tell me that it sometimes, some of my work, that it looks like patterns to them. So it's just, um, 
you know, I think it's just innate for mm -hmm. me. That's great. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, Fung, Fung Huyen is also an artist who's been working with us, a multimedia artist who's been working with us. And she sewed masks for Midnight Mission, which offers emergency services, family living, job training, education, and workforce development to homeless men, women, and children. Um, and Fung, you have a very mixed media practice as well. Um, and sewing also runs in your family too, right? Correct. Um, I do mostly drawing and painting and collage, but um, it's only been the last year or year and a half that I started to use sewing in my practice um, because it was very discouraged. Um, I'm a Vietnamese refugee and my mom always loved to sew and she would sew our clothes and it was actually my mother who helped our family, you know, um, survive like one of the first jobs she got was to sew a costume for fifty dollars for a tv show um, mm -hmm. she loved school but she was never encouraged to finish school because she, you know my grandparents said you're just going to get married and be a wife so she only finished seventh grade so she discouraged my sister and my brothers and i to not sew um, and so when i was five uh, four or five when she would take me to work to the factory where she sewed i would hide under the machine and watch her sew and when she walked away I would like grab a scrap piece of material and and I taught myself how to sew at like four or five and she found out and then she said you know I'm just I'm going to teach you to sew then if this is what you really want to do and initially for this project I always dream of collaborating with my mom and I was going to have her do it with me and then I'm like I'm not going to make my mom do this <laughs> I'm going to do this you know so she provided me the pattern um, and I made the mask, but I did. I felt like my mom worked so hard her whole life for me. I'm not going to make her do, do the work. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting the way, I mean, sewing is, has so much meaning. Um, and that's something that's really come through uh, with our, with, through these sewing circles and through the conversations and stories that people have been telling. Um, Jaconia is uh, our third artist that we're talking with today. And Jaconia, you also sewed for Midnight Mission, but sewing is a really integral part of what you do, right? Absolutely, yes. I, I started um, in manufacturing um, because my mom had a contract sewing company. <clears throat> and every day after school, I would have to go, you know, go there and stay there. Um, and I, I basically learned by myself, I, I would say osmosis, no one actually taught me how to do it. I've been very blessed. I wasn't looking to be in this side of the fashion industry. I was always in love with the modeling um, and the beautiful designs and the traveling and all those things. But as I grew up, I learned that it wasn't as easy back then for uh, someone like me to get into that industry. Anyway, um, I just got up and started at the machine and uh, just sewing it just I just and I did it very well. I, I actually I it's I've been blessed and everywhere I would go, um, whether I was working other jobs or whatever, the sewing would always call me back. People would find out that I could sew and oh, you did that for so that this person and that person. And um, for over 30 years, it was always word of mouth. I really never advertised. Um, and I, I, I can come to your house and sew. I sew in my makeshift studios. I sew on the TV, on the set for videos, um, costumes, movies, um, dancers. I, I'm just like a freelance artist. So because I always accepted everything that came to me, I learned to do a variety of things and as well as wedding gowns and i mean it, it the gamut is so wide um that it's hard to just tell you one thing that i do but the best thing i do is sewing because i've i learned the sewing method and um due to doing uh from the manufacturer's side i did a thing called bundling that's what my mom had me do where you separate the the pieces and, and give them to each uh, party that's going to sew that part of the garment. So initially I learned pattern making through that. It, it, this is just a very odd situation, but I now am able to do all kinds of things. And I have dabbled in, in upholstery. Um, 
I couldn't name names of people that I've worked with, you know, um, on the set and things like that. But, um, you know, I, I think I have to have permission uh, in certain situations to go ahead and say um, what I did for who, because I also work with other designers and in certain things people, um, you know, they wanted certain things kept private. So I wasn't able to show you what I did for this person or that designer and so forth. So I call myself the behind the scenes um, character. And I, I just happen to really love the art of sewing as well um, because I found that I could do it. And once I, I got over the challenge of everything, you know, um, I, I just had a secret laugh to myself, but, but I love it, you know. And um, as far as the mission, that was just someone else that saw my work knew about the situation, called that person, and that person said, no, I'm not the one who did it. This is who did it. So that's how they contacted me. And um, here I am. You know, this well, is my first Zoom, and I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great that, I mean, it's gathering us all together in a, in a space, a kind, of, a, a kind of space that we might not have been able to get together and talk about this work. Right. And one thing that came up yesterday was just how sometimes invisible sewing is in, okay. in many different industries, that you're not named, you're not credited. Um, and so I'm, you know, that was one of the reasons we wanted to do these sewing circles. We wanted to celebrate your work, um, both part of this project, but also beyond that and celebrate the stories and the histories and the experiences that you've had. I'm curious how it has felt to use your sewing skills for make for mask making at this time. I loved it because it gave me an opportunity to get into um, this situation to help somebody in the pandemic, you know, um, and, and I want to continue that. That's the whole thing. It's like, after all this is over, I'm thinking I should go ahead, make some more masks and send to the mission, you know, just, just to back them up, um, just to help the situation. Because of course, as a seamstress, you have so many fabrics uh, and, and materials and, and little things left over. Um, so this, this also gives an opportunity to, to, to utilize things that are just sitting around, you know, um, and I, I think it's just amazing what we're going through today. Um, you know, it, it, it's a lesson. It's a lesson in all we, how, be, how, all we, how we all behave to each other and, and, um, cleanliness is also very important, you know? So I noticed when I was making the mask that you know, I had to make sure everybody knew to wash their masks, you know, and things like that. And I also have clients that I'm already doing masks for, and I'm doing myself uh, some, I've, I've kind of developed a couple more patterns that I hope to share in a little while. Um, one that ties back below the ears and things like that, you know, to, to try to advance the situation because this was an emergency. And I followed um, the criteria that was asked but I would like to do, you know, uh, some more, you know, where they have some more, act, you know, um, uh, uses um, and a tighter fit, you know, the things that are, that are really important. So that's my plan. As long as I get the time to do that, I intend to do yeah. that. Um, well, for me, Drakonia just mentioned a lesson and I've come to this project kind of late and so I'm still in the process of getting started and, and laying out, I got my fabric. I'm still waiting on elastic from um, the vendor. You know, when I got into the project, I found that so many uh, fabrics were either sold out, out of stock, um, or, um, you know, or the prices were, you know, way out of, way out of um, whack for the purpose of the project. And so, um, this is the first time I've sewn where it's like a, a, a production type of thing. So I'm laying stuff out, you know, sort of assembly line fashion yes. and um, proceeding that way. So it's, it's going to be a lesson in efficiency, I think. <laughs> and, um, you know, trying to get things done well, but um, also efficiently. Um, and then the other thing, she mentioned something else. Um, 
I think in terms of creativity, when I pulled my sewing machine out, I said, well, let me make sure this still works. I had gotten it serviced probably over five years ago. Um, I've moved a couple of times, so, you know, I had stuff in storage. Um, and I ha actually had more than one machine. I had my mother's old uh, singers. It's not super old, but I mean, well, she had it when I was a kid, so yeah, it's old. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I still have her sewing machine, too. But I pulled the machine out. I says, well, you know, let me test it, make sure everything is still working before I even make a commitment to this organization that I'm going to do anything. So in doing that, I started playing around with some stitching. And what that has made me want to do is to actually be a little more creative, almost embroidery-like. I have a very basic sewing machine, so I'm kind of interested in what the other ladies have. They may have sergers or something more sophisticated. But it just, like I said, it just brought back um, a desire to be more creative and to incorporate sewing into my creative work as well as the practical aspects. I um, finally got around to mending two of my favorite coats. Um, one of them is a mud fabric and the other one is a sort of a loose weave. I forgot where it's from, um, but they just been, you know, kind of stashed away and needing some mending beyond handwork. And so the other day I got those fixed. So that really kind of got me excited about just about doing more sewing. I have patterns, I have fabric um, that I bought some time ago. And so, um, you know, I'm just looking forward to getting back into making my own clothes and doing something creatively in my practice, um, as well as making masks. I'm, I'd be interested in, in um, learning what Draconia is doing in terms of the patterns, because like she said, um, there were some resources that were offered uh, by the Lucas Museum. I says, okay, with this, you know, if this is apparently something that's working, then I'm just going to go with this and, um, you know, see how it works out. So. We'll yeah. See. And we, we were really, our, the, we have two um, people on our staff who've been really sewing a lot of masks and they were, they pointed us to the, to resources and this, the CDC guidelines for materials and actually, there's a question right now from Facebook uh, and wondering whether um, any of you know of any patterns that don't require a sewing machine. Well, I think you can always hand sew and um, kind of piggybacking off of what Adrian said, like the lack of resources, right? Like Joanne Fabrics and everyone's making masks in quarantine right now. So everybody's overwhelmed and there's a lot of delays in shipping. And so when Aaron Curtis, the curator of the Lucas Museum approached me to make these masks, I'm like, well, how when we can't like get stuff on time and we only have 10 days. So this is where the refugee reflex kicks in, right? Like, how am I going to be resourceful? Um, and I'm like, I, I haven't sewn in, in a long time. You know, I've been busy teaching, taking care of my kids and drawing and painting. And so I, I don't have a fancy machine. It's a really basic single stitch singer and I hand sew too. Um, but my son needed his camel pants hemmed. He wanted them to be convert me to convert them into shorts. So I took the leftover fabric and took over the leftover elastic and whatever on his pants and made a mat, you know? And, and knowing that I couldn't order things on time, I took out flat bed sheets that I don't use that are high quality cotton. You can use denim, like any clothes you don't wear anymore. So for me, I just recycled what I had um, and hair ties. And for this project, cause I was worried I wouldn't get shipments on time. I like masked myself and went to Target, got hair ties and bed sheets, like good quality bed sheets and, and made, you know, a hundred masks from there. But I feel like as artists right now, especially, we got to think of ways to be resourceful and do it with what we have. Cause so many of us are just trying, you know? I have seen some uh, non, oops, um, non sewing type masks. Um, patterns. Some of them are t-shirts where, um, and I've seen people wearing them too, where, you know, you just cut them and cut the holes for your ears and, you know, and they go on without sewing. So there are non-sewing mask patterns out there. And I think if you just Google it, you'll find it. As a matter of fact, I think even the CDC has um, a non-sewn mask that you can make. So there, I've seen a lot of different resources in terms of the types of masks that you can make, either sewn or non-sewn. 
Um, so in that respect, I think, you know, it, it shouldn't be too hard to find something. And then, of course, people can just tie on a bandana or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Jacoria, right. did you? I, yeah. I wanted to say that um, <clears throat> I hear you ladies talking about the basic sewing machines that you have. And as someone that has sewn in many types, um, industrial as well, as well as home sewing machines, the basic machine is your best friend. So many times <laughs> I have had to do projects like in the same day and have it ready for tonight and things like that. And when you get into these machines that have all these things that you can do on them, they become slow and tedious. And I always have to revert to my most basic machine. And since I also travel and do projects in different places, it's also the easiest machine, most dependable to carry everywhere that you know I work. And um, because you have your basic zigzag and your straight stitch. And um, I would say just be sure you hold on to your basic machines no matter what comes. And as far as the masks mask are concerned that are non-stitch, my concern is the ties are fine, but one of the main concerns I have is the breathing and a lot of people have allergies. So I've been trying my best to find um, fibers and things that are um, uh, not, a, not going to be a, a problem eventually because the rubber in the elastics, the glue in the pelons, the glue that they use to put mass together and things like that. One must be aware that you're breathing through these things. And certain things weren't made for us to put against our face, like um, filter bags from your, from your vacuum cleaner and, and your uh, uh, filter that comes from your uh, air conditioning. I get that it's an emergency and we have to do what we can, but be, bear in mind that there are, um, situations that these things weren't made to put against your face and breathing, okay? Because you have poisons in them, uh, things that are toxic. So, um, you know, my best advice, if you don't have a machine and, and you really need to put a mask on, just use a cotton t-shirt. And, and like the lady said, um, cut a hole for your ears or, or a tie back. The kinds we're talking about with machines is usually something that's um, a little more polished you know, um, and we'll take it through the, uh, the ways you have to clean them and things like that. But one really can, in an emergency, just cut a t-shirt um, and hopefully double it across your face and, and cut two, you know, strings and time around your ears if you have to, or your neck and your head over your head, you know, and boom, there it is. No glue, you know, and, and all these things that we're not sure of because um, this happens so fast that we're, we're learning every day something else is different. So that's what I do. Every day I wake up, I check uh, my emails and um, the latest news that's happening, what's happening to people. Some people are getting dizzy wearing these masks too long, you know, and, and just various little situations. So I just want to advise people to be careful um, and, and be as safe as possible and and that's about it and 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 another thing um ladies please feel free to call me after the interview or at a, a more convenient time and i'll be happy to discuss any um things i have i can share with you on um, and you know whatever just feel free to call me and we can go from there thank you thank you oh you're Nicole, very yeah. welcome it's such a pleasure I mean, and it's true. It's like, and what you're talking about this, you know, we're all learning together and we're yes. sharing information together as we get it. We're trying to navigate conflicting information sometimes. Um, and it's also making, I mean, for me, it's making me think about health in, a, in really in like a multifaceted ways. And so I wondered what you're all doing for your own mental health through this time. How are you taking care of yourself? You know, I, uh, Fung, I, you know, can sympathize with having little ones, a little one at home and you're trying to get your work done and all of this. All right, what's, what are you doing to take care of yourself and be creative still at the same time? Oh my, actually the mask making was very much needed because the institutional way of being an artist is you make work that's exhibited in museums and spaces that are now closed, right? So for me making, even after I made masks, for this Lucas Museum Commission. I was making masks for my friends and for Kogi. Um, it's been very healing, 
you know, because there's a sense of solidarity that we're all in it together. And that now what I usually do in making art is funneled into making these masks that I can share with people that they can have. But it's also made me think a lot about women's labor. You know, growing up like um, Jaconia, I'm a garment factory kid, you know, I, and my <laughs> parents were able to have a factory later. And I grew around, uh, up around, you know, aunties and moms. And if they can't come to the factory, my parents gave a machine at home. So there'd be a bassinet next to the machine, right, taking care of the baby as they're sewing to provide for their family. And I'm like, I'm feeling that because I was sewing until like <laughs> midnight. I'm like, oh, time to cook, you know. Uh, but I have two boys and I think as women, we need to restructure and make them understand what women's labor is about. But I'm teaching my son, you need to sew too. You need to learn how to sew too. And you need to learn how to clean too, you know. Um, I think understanding how this is related to, to gender and deconstructing that is very important for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think of it as really a, a life skill. You know, like I said, it used to be part of the general curriculum in school, although it was, it tended to be gender specific. You know, if there was a boy in, in the home ec class, that was very rare and vice versa. If there was a girl in a shop class, that was rare, but I would have loved if they made that mandatory for everybody, you know, who, who can't use a good bandsaw or whatever. But, um, and then also you mentioned your son. My son decided to learn to sew when he was, I don't know. I mean, he is, he's an adult and he decided, you know, I'm going to take a sewing class. So he went to Pasadena City College and he took a sewing class. He's not so much interested in fashion, but I mean, like I said, sewing is a, it's a, it's a life skill. It's very practical for a lot of things. If you look around, a lot of things are sewn. So, um, you know, I, I think it's important. And then in terms of self-care, I listen to music. I have very eclectic taste, but um, what I find is that when I start feeling, you know, like I'm gonna wig out, <laughs> um, I'll, <laughs> I'll put on music and depending on my mood or, you know, or, or the version <laughs> of whatever direction where I think I'm, I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> Um, I'll put on a particular kind of music. It's like the other day, and, and even today, you know, it was hot. Last week, it was really hot. So I found environments, ocean waves music. And I swear, I really felt cooler. Um, you know, just, you know, you're just listening to the ocean waves crashing. So that's one of the things that I, music is very important to me, actually. When I'm making art, I listen to music. Um, so that's one thing. And then just paying more attention, I think, to just being, um, being in the moment, being around the house and really, um, there's a lot of busy work, but I, I, at the same time, I feel like it's more focused and the things that I do are much more intentional now in terms of um, how is this going to enrich my life? You know, it can be something very simple, but if you simply take the time to do it or you just, you know, I go outside and I sit and I listen to the birds, that's calming and relaxing to me. Um, so I don't know, that's it. I eat better. I'm more um, intentional and disciplined about really taking care of myself nutritionally and all of that, you know, keeping my immune system boosted. Um, so I don't know, that's the kind of stuff. And I talk to friends, you know, on the phone. Um, and I don't know, that's about it. I, I have not really been as um, active in terms of my, my art practice. I had some projects that were, uh, that I was in the midst of that got canceled and it, it kind of made a weird, um, it broke the energy. So, you know, I have, you know, it's, it's like I look at some pieces that I have and it's almost like they just came to a, a, a rapid halt and they're still hanging there. You know, it's almost like a time capsule. They're just, mm. they're just there. And I'll get back to it, but, you know, really getting back into that energy is a little more challenging maybe than I would have thought because I'm always thinking about, okay, what, what do I need to do to, um, to really to make sure that I'm as prepared as I need to be to deal with whatever is going to happen. I will say, I agree with you. I, I personally don't have children. 
Um, but I do respect and understand what you go through because of course my mom had me, you know, during all that. And um, my first thing I have to say is prayer, uh, whatever you believe in, you know, your God, um, but I'm a God conscious person. That's what I'm going to say. And uh, prayer, meditation, whatever, I prepare my mind sometimes the night before so that when my day starts, I said, okay, this is what, whatever project I think I'm going to do, I prepare my, my mind to say, well, whatever I do today, I'm going to accomplish this. And wherever I go to sow, whatever it is, my mind is already made up that nothing's going to deter me from uh, the goal I have at hand and to keep my word to whomever I'm working with, you know? And music is, oh yes, the, the <laughs> oh my God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, I don't know what I would do without music. And of course I, yes, and I, I love positive music. I listen to any positive music, whether it's rock, reggae, classical, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's just, it has to have anything with lyrics in it, it has to be positive. If it comes on and, and I feel a negative energy, I just switch the channel. You know, I just keep it moving, keep it smooth, keep my energy, um, uh, you know, calm, calm. Because sewing is a very stressful situation, especially when you're limited <laughs> by time um, and funds. You know, you, you just have to make it happen. And um, yes, reggae definitely, uh, gospel definitely uh, is in my mix. And uh, breathing, one must remember to take a breather, get up from the sewing machine, walk away from the table, whatever you need to do, step outside for two minutes, breathe, thank God, and come back in. You'll be so surprised how your energy um, just, oh, okay, I can see again, you know? I'm back at my machine, I'm doing what I'm doing. So I would always say, um, whatever meditation you can have, uh, start off your day praising God, you know, thank you for the day, um, and supplying all my needs today. And you go at it, you get your music on and, and, um, just, just, just go, you, 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 I, I tend to go into it. I give my all in whatever I'm doing. Like I, and I won't answer phones if, if, because to me, the momentum is so very important. And you could be like in 10 minutes, you'll finish the project and you stop to answer the phone. And one word somebody says inside your eardrum can change your whole attitude. You come back and you only stay like two seconds on the phone. <laughs> you come back to your machine, you're thrown, you're done. It's, it's like it's, you can't get that same vibration back again until you go through recalming yourself. So my advice, when you really have something serious you want to get done, put the phones to the side. Let them know they have to leave a message. Or leave, leave something that says it's, it's really urgent that you call me right back. Because I don't, I don't like the disturbance. I, I really get into it, me and my God and my soul. You know? and, um, but I, music, music is definitely the key. I, I, I am, I'm with that to all the ladies because it creates the environment and it, it's sort of like a white noise around you because there's always noises around you. Now, I, I get that you have to watch your children so you can't tune, tune out like I do. But <laughs> even when you can, that is the best, the best sewing experience you can get. Because like when you're one with God, like me, I'm one with the machine. My body has actually um, changed over the years so that I can function. I have a, a hump in my back, you know, my finger is bent and... You know, all the things that you go through uh, now my tummy, you know, from sitting on the chair, you know, doing a lot. Because usually I just cut. I like to cut everything first. And then when I get to the sewing, then I'm done. I'm done. I don't go back and forth, you know, unless it's something that I have to uh, rearrange or I need another little piece or something. But that's also another way that I do it. I make sure and cut, get everything that I need prepared. Like if you want to cook a meal. You need your carrots, your celery, whatever. You want to chop it all up, get, get everything prepared. Then you get to the pot. So basically, that's how I practice it. <laughs> Long-winded Well, and, and, you know, yeah, and Jaconia, I mean, you're, 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 you're also kind of talking about where your mind and your body are in sync. And yes. you kind of get in this flow of things. And, you know, 
And, it, and almost, you know, you're almost kind of talking about being connected to something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. And through these, through these sewing circles, um, a couple of the, the artists have talked about feeling connected to their families. And, you know, we've all, you've all touched on this today. And, I, and some of them have actually had um, uh, objects or materials or sew, sewing machines that, that belonged to family members. I'm wondering if sewing is something that's connected you to different generations of your family. Um, for and how, me, and whether you use something that is that belonged to somebody else, or that you made something really special for somebody else in your family that you're proud of. I have done so many things. <laughs> it's just um, from plays for little children. Um, I, I, you know, what it's it's like because I didn't choose it. I know I'm spiritually connected and. Uh, and I'm chosen, like I'm chosen to do this because it comes to me with such flow. Um, I work very hard, but there is an ease in it when you are, when you're in tune, when you're one with the thing you're dealing with. And um, I'll do uh, Halloween clothes for babies and kids and um you know, I stopped, I, I stopped to alter something because the kid says, well, it's too big for me or, you know, it, it's whatever I'm called to do, as long as I'm able to do it, I just do it. And I get so much love back from people, you know, appreciating the fact that I just stopped to do it, you know, and I just keep things simple for the most part. Um, when it comes to family, I give my mom the most respect. She's no longer with us, but due to her, um, there was a part in her life when I was in her life that sewing was the thing. And the actual first dress my mom sewed for me when I was a child was uh, a red lace dress. And I remember there's a, a word called crinoline. I don't know if you all are familiar with it. It's the petticoat that you wear underneath. And in that era, it's it, st it sticks you in your waistline and so I'm fitting the dress and she's trying it on and I'm wiggling and and I'm and she, mom goes well darling sometimes you have to bear pain to be beautiful I was like okay mom <laughs> so I kept that it's always been there for me you know and that was my first experience with someone actually making a dress at all or anything like that and I, I treasure the moment because lo and behold here I am fitting people and now, and so I know to be kind to them. Uh, sometimes you're fitting people and they are the most fidgety person you have ever met because they just can't sit still and, oh, you're going to poke me. And I'm like, no, my finger is behind it. I will not poke you. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, that is. Each thing is so different, you know. Your story about have you know about having your mom sew for you. I'm curious if a if Adrian or Fang whether you've had somebody make something for you or you have a memory from childhood um, with you, with uh, sewing. Yeah, um, I'm lucky that my mom sews. And when we were in the refugee camp in Thailand, she didn't. Uh, I didn't have enough clothes, so she took her pajamas and made me two sets of clothes. And when I got married, she made my wedding dress. So I feel like sewing is such a personal thing that connects us to each other, especially those who are closest to us, which I love about sewing, right? Like um, Jaconia talking about fitting individuals. I mean, people go to stores and they buy a size, what size am I? They don't think about this for me. So I feel very fortunate that my mom growing up would make clothes for me. Like I'm not kind sort of body image issues but it is such a personal thing and and it's something to think about in this time and this time where we can't fit somebody in person mm. right so um how does that play into that where we can't physically touch people and fit them anymore how do how does that inform mm. our practice and our sewing that's such a great that's such a great point. Um, while we're on this topic of different bodies and the and the masks, we did have a question from Facebook about whether any of you had seen any masks or patterns uh, made with people who are deaf in mind who rely might rely on reading lips um, and you know and 
that that kind of um, need to really adapt uh, to different bodies and abilities is is really um, uh, something that we're all going to have to do. So, have you seen for any any patterns for that? That's the first time I've I've ever been asked anything about the the the, the um the, the death or, lip reading. You know, yeah, yeah. And I must admit, as I'm going through all the thoughts about you know working with with these different masks for people, that is really fascinating. Now, I have seen a mask where there is a plastic, they put a clear plastic right in the face uh, area uh, where the mouth is. Yeah. And they were just doing it for a design. However, that's one way of, of trying to do something. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can develop something okay. for that because that is simply fascinating. And I'm able to do patterns and I create projects and things like that. So I'm going to try my best to see what I can do uh, for the people that need to speak that way. This is really amazing. Yeah, that's pretty challenging. Yeah. I would think I hadn't yeah. really thought about that, about that community. And um, you know, even if there's a clear plastic, I don't know that someone would be able to see um, one breed. And two, yeah. would they even be still be able to see to decipher what somebody is saying um, with the clear plastic? Um, I saw a meme the other day. Actually, it was it was kind of a joke, um, but it it was talking about okay, the bars are opening up, so this is my mask, and the mask was made um, so that you know how you have those. Um, baby wipes, a little pop-up top. It was built into the mask, so it was flipped up <laughs> so that the mouth was exposed, you could go drink, right? <laughs> but, but now that I think about it, that's funny, but it would almost be a very practical kind of thing to do because if you flipped it up or to the side or however it went, or a mask that maybe had Velcro that you could, you know, hmm. slip down so that people can actually see the mouth when they're speaking directly to a person who is, um, hard of hearing or deaf. I mean, that, is, that just brings up a whole nother, um, yeah, another aspect. about people and access, you know, what that means. Everybody's wearing a mask. Well, now what, you know, if you don't know sign language, then, you know, that's, that's, I don't know, it could be very isolating. We're already isolated. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that could be even more so. so that's something to think about. Yeah. yeah. And Adrian, I want to be sure also to let you tell your your story of any you know having things made for you or making something for someone else. Um, I remember my mother making clothes for my sister more so than myself. I had two older sisters, and what I remember were um, you know her making a, a something for I don't know if it was prom or something like that. And to this day, there's a, a garment that wasn't finished. It's like a little coat dress. And it's been hanging in the closet for I don't know how many decades. Um, yeah. And I've looked at it, you know, and going through the cycles of purging things. I, you know, I'm, I'm sentimental, number one. Um, you can see on my studio all this stuff I have in here. Um, so every time I look at it, I was like, you know, I should just get rid of this. It still has pins in it in a few places, but I, I could never get rid of it. So I still have it hanging in a closet. And then... Um, I still have my mother's sewing machine. Um, it's a singer. Um, and the little table that, uh, that it came with, which I wish I had now, the leg broke on it recently, but I kept it because I really want to get it fixed because it's stable. The table that I'm using now, it's like when I start sewing, if I'm really getting into this, I mean, the machine is like jumping on it because it's not built to, to be sewn on. Um, but those are, that's kind of the main thing that I really remember. And then I also have a photograph of my mother and her cousin when she was about 14. And in that photograph, she's wearing a skirt. And I remember her telling me that she made that skirt. So every time I look at it, you know, I think, wow, you know, so she was sewing way back then. And um, she was the one that uh, enrolled me in this sewing class where I learned, you know, some tips and tricks that stick with me today really about um, how to make a garment look well, um, you know, look professional. Um, so that's, that's kind of my, my sewing memories, I guess you could yeah. say. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, this, this conversation has been really amazing in terms of thinking about women's labor and who's, and uh, the visibility of it. And also the importance of, of sewing as a, as a life skill and, and the ways in which we all kind of use our strengths at these moments of crisis. And so I wanted to wish you all well um, during this time and thank you for participating in this project, for sewing um, for our neighbors um, and, you know, to really um, I wish you the best as we will eventually emerge out of this. Um, and I want to give you one, one uh, second to plug anything you're working on, anywhere that you're showing, Fung. I saw with um, self-help graphics that you are going to be participating in their online auction. So anything that you want to go out with, a last uh, greeting or something that you're working on that you want to share with anyone who's watching? Uh, if I would, I would like to give special mention uh, to Yo Sky. Um, by Lori Precious. She also donated um, some wonderful 100% African material toward the project. And behind me is one of her hand, hand painted from Ethiopia. She helps women helping women. And I just wanted to give special mention um, to her and thank her personally on the, on the video. And as well, um, ladies, it's, it's a um, amazing as my first Zoom to meet and talk with you this way, not able to touch. However, I send you my greetings, my best wishes for your future, and a great big virtual hug to everyone out there. And um, we'll talk again soon. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Jaconia. Um, I'm I've been a teaching artist fellow at. Armory Center for the Arts. And so um, obviously they've had to close, but they're also um, transitioning to some, you know, digital and virtual art experiences. So I've been trying to keep up um, with the development and contributing whatever I can to that effort where, you know, people can go online and um, access either exhibits or actually projects. Um, another thing that I'm doing is with a um, Flux Art Space in Long Beach is doing an art exchange where you can make some art and mail it and then you'll get something back similar to artist trading cards. Um, so that, um, I've had a couple of exhibits that got canceled. So then those are the things where it's like the work is like suspended in, you know, since it's been in animation right now. Right now. Um, and once I finish these masks, I'll really get back into um, the flow of uh, doing that work. So, I, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of little things going on, so. That's great. Some stuff with Metropolis projects. Um, we have actually an exhibition, a, a virtual exhibition on Instagram um, and some artist talks that are going with that. So those are kind of the me, main um, three activities that I'm involved with is Metropolis projects, um, the Armory and Flux art space, and then, you know, a whole lot of stuff in between. Thank you. Um, I want to just say thank you to um, everyone on the sewing circle. It's been such an honor and such a privilege. I'm a community college teacher, so I really miss my students. So I just want to give a shout out to them and like to really hang in there and to all my friends and family who came. Um, I definitely want to thank Erin Curtis for inviting me to do this and Rebecca Hall, the curator of the USC Pacific Asia Museum. She curated and included me in this very important show that was the first contemporary art show of Asian American artists in LA. And for the first time I was able to speak about and make work about my refugee experience and my community. Um, so hopefully that will be able to reopen in months to come, who knows, right? Um, but yeah, shout out to Self Help Graphics um, for inviting me to participate in making prints for the census, that it's very important that we participate and that all our communities who are underrepresented are, are visible and that we, we make sure we count. I think it's really important. And, and during this very, very important time that we support each other and, and just be there for each other. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity to meet 
um, all you wonderful, wonderful women today. Pleasure to meet you too. Yeah, thank you all. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you.